Dr. Sonia Mather is our fabulous moderator. We love having her. She is a Davis Finney Foundation board member. She has been living with Parkinson's for over 20 years. She's a former family physician and she brings so much insight to these interviews. So we, we're so happy to have you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mather, and you may take it away. Thank you so much, Mel. So good afternoon, everyone. As Mel mentioned, my name is Dr. Sonia Mather. I'm a family physician and a Parkinson's patient. Having lived with this challenge for now, well over a couple of decades, um, I have the privilege of ser serving on the board of directors for the Davis Finney Foundation, and I have the pleasure of being your moderator today. You know, although we as patients wish there was obviously a cure for Parkinson's disease, and although there's a whole community of researchers and clinicians working hard to achieve this, this remains for the time being an incurable neurodegenerative illness. So what is most important to us as patients? Well, I believe it's quality of life, living well despite Parkinson's. And that's what we're gonna be discussing today with our expert guest, Dr. M Dr. Michael Oaken. Dr. Oaken is a movement disorder specialist who's currently chair of neurology, professor and executive director at the, of the Normal Fixal Institute for Neurological Diseases at the University of Florida Health College of Medicine. He has written many books and is also one of the co-authors of his highly anticipated newest book, Living with Parkinson's Disease, A Complete Guide for Patients and Caregivers, which is available on Amazon and other sources. Welcome, Dr. Oaken. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I always enjoy spending an hour with you and also say, uh, Dr. Mathur, for, for those patients and caregivers, not only is she a board member of Davis Finney, but she has a wonderful blog uh, that you should follow and a great Twitter following and, and uh, so I've enjoyed reading and, wow. um, and hearing your insights and so it's great to be with you today. Thanks so much. Dr. Ogun, maybe to get the discussion started, could you explain to us maybe why you were inspired to write this book? Like why do people living with Parkinson's need such a guide? Yeah, so um, I, I actually you know learn like everyone else over time and and you know as we get a little older and the hair gets a little more gray, we, we begin to, I think, maybe get a little bit wiser. And so I think early on in my career, I was very focused and still am very focused on research. But, um, you know, I realized that, you know, when I started writing more patients and more information for patients and more information for families, that, um, that you know, in some large multiple the amount that what I would write would be read was so much larger than uh, any of the research papers. So if you take 500 research papers that I've been involved with with co-authors, the things that I've written for patients have probably been read thousands, if not even larger multiples than any of those um, single papers. And when we did the book, 10 Secrets you know, to a Happier Life, we, you know, it wasn't meant to be a runaway bestseller, but that Parkinson treatment book, I mean, it just has gone crazy. And still, even now, um, you know, a lot of people still read this book. And, and it really opened my eyes and opened, I think, a lot of people's eyes to just this idea that we need to do better at, at getting facts and tips and how to live with the disease out to patients. And so we wrote the first book. And then, of course, people said, well, what about what's new? And that was the, one of the tips. And so we wrote a book about about research, but this is kind of the third book in the series, The Living with Parkinson's book, and it's really, you know, a, a, an answer to the community saying we need better recipes, we need better, we need, we need more on the tips of how we can live with this, you know, disease, and now we believe you, you, you can live a happier life with Parkinson's, we believe you, but how about giving us a little more guidance along the road and so that's that's you know really what this is all about and it makes little things can make a big difference and so so we really want to uh, wanted to put something together where we gave away all of our tricks and so Dr. Malati and uh, Dr. Wissam Deeb at the University of Florida at the Fixel Institute we we got together and given away a lot of our secrets so it, it was a fun book to write. And it's a fun book to read it's really quite exciting. There's a lot of information. I would encourage people to pick it up. I think it would make a big difference to have just sort of everything in one kind of, you know, um, well presented, well thought out format. So I think it's great. 
Um, in the first chapter of the book, Dr. Oaken, you talk about the importance of a correct diagnosis and being involved with this community for so many years. I've heard so many people talk about their um, stories about how difficult it was for them to get a diagnosis of Parkinson's, their journey going from patient, you know, from doctor to doctor without any definitive answers. Why does this happen? You know, um, it's, it's quite a curiosity, right? And I think that the way that you address this is, you know, is spot on, you know, like why in the world are we still talking about getting the right diagnosis? I mean, we seem to need to be, you know, much further down the road, but it turns out that there is a huge shortage of Parkinson's disease specialists. So we train about 40 a year, four zero, okay, for the most rapidly expanding neurological disorder on earth. We train 40 a year. And, uh, and we don't provide any funding in the United States for them, no Medicare funding, nothing. So it's not like you, you meet these kids that train in cardiology and nephrology and internal medicine, you're in internal medicine. And so we don't, we don't actually uh, have a, a mechanism to mint people. So it ends up being worldwide, not just in the United States, it ends up being a, um, a, a burden, if you want to call it a burden, of the general doctor. So take care of everything, GYN problems, take care of, of prostate problems, take care of heart, liver, lung. And by the way, if they happen to have Parkinson's disease, make sure you take care of that too. And this is you know, pretty much how things have gone. And so what happens is, is that the interaction is pretty abnormal, you know, and I would say suboptimal and you go to see a doctor and sometimes even a general neurologist who doesn't have a lot of um, information about Parkinson's disease themselves because they see a lot of other disorders in their practice and it takes a long time to see a Parkinson patient and they just get it wrong. Either they get the diagnosis wrong, but they actually deliver the diagnosis wrong and they're telling people that this is not a livable disease. And we've just heard this story over and over again on our helplines and in uh, the Ask the Doctor forum that, that, that I had been uh, moderating for 14 years until we retired it this year. And it's been, um, it's been a humbling experience. And I can tell you, Sonia, that it's something that disappoints me. And I just don't want to see any more patients diagnosed and receive those words, you have Parkinson's disease, without the empathy, but also without the background to understand that this is a livable disease and this isn't the end of the road. So if a patient suspects either that they have Parkinson's and they haven't received the diagnosis or that, you know, they're having these sort of vague neurological symptoms, is it important for them to see a specific type of physician, a general neurologist or um, someone that's even subspecialized in that? Yeah, what we recommend is, you know, obviously in this um, and this may seem, you know, like everybody should know this, but let me just take a minute and, and go over it because I, I often have now learned as I've aged that never to assume things. And, and, you know, so when it comes to shaking, you know, in Parkinson and four out of five people may have shaking, one out of five may not. When it comes to, you know, symptoms that you think could be attributable to Parkinson or some neurological disorder, certainly starting with a specialist is a good idea, okay? And it's not to, to say that generalists aren't good and some generalists can't handle it. It's just, if you were gonna play percentages, you would see a specialist like a neurologist. And if you have the opportunity to see somebody who may have done either advanced training, called a fellowship in Parkinson and movement disorders, or dedicate you know, more than half of their practice to Parkinson's disease or some large percentage, you're going to get to the answer and you're going to get better care and you're going to get you know, sort of a better, a better strategy short and long term. So that's, that's what we've been recommending. Although on the other side, I must admit that we're spending a lot of time now thinking about how to develop education programs and partnerships for you know, general internists, family practitioners, and we're beginning to try to train that group of individuals too, because they're going to be part of the solution. So we can't just, you know, ignore the fact that, you know, we have tremendous numbers of patients that need to get treated. We need to recognize that we need to bring people into the solution. And, and so for people suffering now, certainly get to the most specialized that you can as quickly as you can, 
for a long term, we need to be thinking of a, of a better public health solution. So you use um, in the book, the acronym TRAP, tremor, rigidity, akinesia, bradykinesia, slower movement, and postural instability, or I guess problems with balance to describe the motor symptoms of the disease. As you mentioned, we don't always have all of those. And there's also some, a group of non-motor symptoms. What are some of the non-motor symptoms briefly that people can get with Parkinson's? Yeah, so uh, we often talk a lot about the motor symptoms. It's kind of like if you go to the dentist, right? They look at your teeth. So if you go to a quote, movement disorders neurologist, they look at your movements. They look at your, your shuffling and your, and your your tremors and your movement. But if you sort of look a little below the waterline, some people use that old cliche of the iceberg, there are all these symptoms that are not seen or not visible to the eye. Many of them are the so-called non-motor symptoms, which is not the greatest name, right? That means everything besides motor, right? So it's not like the most creative name. But Parkinson's disease as a construct is the most complex disease in clinical medicine because it has the most number of motor and non-motor symptoms. It has a response to dopamine. It has all these fluctuations and things that emerge over time with disease progression. People turn on and off. It doesn't happen you know, in other diseases. Then we put electrodes in brains and pumps in stomachs and we do all sorts of stuff with cocktails of medication. So the non-motor symptoms can include a list of over 20 symptoms, including most prominently depression, anxiety, sexual dysfunction, um, apathy, urinary dysfunction. And so there, there is just a tremendous number. And, and I'll just say, you didn't ask, but I'll throw it in, that if you look collectively at the studies in the literature, the clear signature pattern is these non-motor symptoms, depression, anxiety, apathy in particular affect quality of life in a Parkinson patient more than the motor symptoms. And if you go to most neurologists or most general practitioners, they only treat the motor symptoms. This is a problem. This is a disconnect. And, um, and neurologists and general practitioners need to be pushed to not punt away the ball. So if you're not into football, not punt it away, and, but, but actually to to, to take on those problems and learn how to treat them. Because if you treat them, it has a much greater impact on the quality of life. Absolutely. I, I can't agree more with that. Um, as you also say in the book, not everything that quacks like a duck is a duck. And so what are some of the other conditions um, that have features that look like Parkinson's but are actually quite different? Some of the Parkinsonism types of, of um, diseases and others. Yeah, so uh, it's an important point um, that not everything that looks like Parkinson or sounds like Parkinson turns out to be regular Parkinson. So how do you know if it's regular Parkinson or not? And so we look uh, for symptoms. Some people call them red flags, but let's just say clues, you know, and meaning this is why you don't want to spend five minutes with your doctor if you have these symptoms or your healthcare team, because sometimes it takes a little time to come up with some of these clues. So so if you're having trouble moving your eyes, particularly up or down, you might have what the famous actor from Arthur Dudley Moore, the pianist, had. you may have progressive supranuclear palsy. If you're falling or having problems with walking or falls early on, you may have one of these disorders like what some people call PSP or progressive supranuclear palsy. If you're having trouble with thinking and hallucinations within the first couple of years, of your Parkinson, you might have something called Lewy body disease. Um, if you have problems with skilled movements, knowing how to do skilled movements, we give everything a name and then we bill for it as neurologists. You know that as an internist, right? So, uh, so something called apraxia, problems with skilled movements, or maybe the hand is doing something that we don't want it to do. That's called an alien limb or, or elevating out of a out of a chair while you're sitting in a chair. You might have a Parkinsonian syndrome called corticobasal degeneration. And, and probably the most common one that we see confused with Parkinson is called multiple system atrophy. And that's where you may get dizziness when you stand up too fast. Now you can get any of these symptoms with Parkinson's and that's where it gets tricky to separate. But if you get early and prominent, you know, problems with your blood pressure, dizziness when you stand up, uh, unsteadiness when you're walking, you know, early on, 
uh, problems digesting um, or absorbing medications or a lot of problems with urination or emptying your bladder very early on. These may be signs of what are called Parkinsonism. Now this is where people get confused and I've seen some questions lighting up here on the, on the, uh, on the screen. And so just to explain it, if you have any of these symptoms, the, the slowness, the so-called bradykinesia, the shuffling of your steps, people could term that Parkinsonian, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean you have Parkinson's disease. When people refer to Parkinson's disease, they are referring usually to a disorder that has a typical slow progression or slower progression and has a response to dopamine, okay? And if you see some of these other features, again, some people call them red flags, but let's just call clues or other symptoms. You might have something else, or if you're taking the medicines and you're not responding, there might be something else going on. And people have used these terms like secondary Parkinson's, you know? They've used terms like Parkinsonian disorders. They've used terms like Parkinson plus. And imagine how confusing this is as a patient. Like you're trying to read through all this literature. You know, what the heck are they talking about? And so it becomes very confusing for patients. And so what we talk about when we talk about Parkinson's disease, regular garden variety Parkinson's disease, you know, not everybody has to have tremor, but certainly tremor stiffness, slowness, um, these are common features, and typically we don't see a lot of walking or falling problems at the time of diagnosis and or any of these eye problems or a lot of these problems with digestion or dizziness. It's not true in every case, but we certainly look for these things and look for the absence of other things, and we also want to see a response to dopamine. Uh, but all these terms are really confusing for patients. Is it important for people to know the difference between is, is the treatment approach different for these other um, Parkinsonisms or or other illnesses that sort of seem like they might be Parkinson's disease? It, it could be very different, and that's a, a very good point. Although there are some commonalities, right, to treating slowness, it could be very different. For example, the depression, okay, the depression and the levels of depression and anxiety and apathy may be much higher in patients with Parkinsonian disorders. Uh, patients with progressive supranuclear palsy and some of these other things that look like Parkinson's disease may laugh at times when things aren't funny and cry at times when things aren't sad, and that may be completely disabling. We see that much more commonly by a multiple, many times more commonly in these disorders, particularly in PSP. If you fall and fracture a hip because somebody doesn't pick up that you have PSP early, that could totally change your treatment course. And then people have assumed incorrectly that all of these uh, syndromes do not respond to dopamine, but it turns out we have um, many patients with multiple system atrophy or with Lewy body or with PSP who may have dopamine responses. And so we, they have to, come in and they've got to, we've got to examine them, we've got to keep them safe, and we've got to create the right cocktails, both of therapy. And we talk about drugs, and in the book we talk about um, people like me are drug dealers, right? We're MDs. You're a drug dealer too, Dr. Barber, sorry, but uh, we give all these medicines and prescriptions, so we're the drug dealers, but, but in a lot of these syndromes, it's much more powerful to have a good interdisciplinary approach and, and to bring in physical, occupational, and speech and swallow as some primary um, specialists that can really help to, to treat these patients. Right. You know, absolutely. And we're going to talk more about those being the drug dealer as well as the team approach in just a few minutes. But I just want to move on a little bit. Um, so once you've received your diagnosis and you start to get the, your head around the news, you've come to accept the PD as part of your future, which can take some time for some of us to come to that emotional acceptance. It's time to become an active participant in your management. And the one thing I've learned on my own journey with this disease and seeing those in my Parkinson's community is that you can't be a passive bystander and expect to live well with Parkinson's. You have to, at some point, take control over those variables that you do have control over. So I'd like to talk to you for the next few minutes about the advice you have about lifestyle changes, exercise and rehab, as well as nutritional issues. So, I mean, first of all, we all know that we should exercise. It's good for our hearts, our lungs, our bones, our general health. 
But what disease specific benefits are there for people with Parkinson's disease? Yeah, so this is a, a, a great question. And so starting with the construct of exercise, um, you know, it sounds a little contrived, right? You know, just exercise. And, you know, we all tell people exercise, it has health benefits. But, you know, I want to stress, and this is something that we talk about in the Living with Parkinson Disease book, that, you know, from the very beginning in Parkinson's disease, from the history of Parkinson's disease, we didn't have dopamine. And in many cases, patients were hospitalized or put into asylums, like you saw in, um, in the book Awakenings and you know, post-flu Parkinson's. And they needed places to live, you know, homes or nursing home facilities. And before dopamine, they would follow the doctors on the rounds. And rounds would mean you would round around to the different rooms. The, the younger doctors don't understand that anymore because it's all different now, but you would put your charts on a rack and you would round, right? We're in electronic medical records. And so they would have the patients round with them, okay? Push the chart cart, fold towels, okay? And they realized that um, this was actually good. The, the patients would do better the more they exercise. So exercise therapy has been around even before dopamine. And of course, when a, a powerful drug and, and the greatest two advances in the field have been dopamine and deep brain stimulation, at least in terms of magnitude of change for the Parkinson patients. And so we now have moved from a construct of just you know, exercise has good health benefits to exercise actually can help Parkinson to we have now collectively a lot of studies showing that it's, it has positive, very positive benefits symptomatically, both in motor symptoms and in non-motor symptoms. So now every Parkinson specialist recommends exercise for the patients. And if you read the, the latest um, review in JAMA, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association by Melissa Armstrong and I, it's very prominently featured in there. And even in the last viewpoint we did for JAMA, that this is, the field has changed, you know, it's rocked. And the thing that people ask us the most about is, okay, well, that's, that's fine, you know, but what exercise do we do? You know, like, what are we supposed to do? I mean, you keep saying do exercise. And so many of the studies now have shown benefits. You know, Tai Chi was one of the early ones that showed a, a benefit, surprisingly. Um, in a lot of ways, people didn't think that that would be, you know, something that would show benefit because it wasn't as aerobic as other things, treadmill training, um, some of the, the stretching and, and less aerobic, um, you know, lifting of weights and things have shown changes. And so now you have a whole generation of young, middle, and uh, more senior researchers beginning to look at dose and types of exercise that can be done. And even one at the Cleveland Clinic, Jay Alberts, who's an old friend, that looks at, at forcing exercise a little bit beyond your, your capacity. So forced cycling and cycling being a, another, another one and seeing benefits with different exercises. You know, so for example, Christopher Haas has shown some benefit you can multitask better when you're on a exercise bike than when you're doing other forms of exercise and so so we're also learning what might be better for different patients and so what's most frustrating now for the patients isn't so much that we we tell them you know exercise is good exercise is like a drug what's frustrating is is they want to know specifically the answer we're starting to shine some light on that uh, we do know that if you don't do enough exercise, so probably 30, 40 minutes a day, even if you have the balance problems and you need to do it seated, there are a lot of seated exercises that you can do as well. You need to really get to 30. Most of the experts are saying get to at least 30, 40 minutes a day or more. Don't be an Olympian and try to do it for multiple hours a day. We have several patients that overdo it and then they get too tired and they can't perform in their regular, um, their regular activities. Getting your heart rate up. Is, seems to be important and staying safe without falling. So if you can meet those general criteria, no matter what the Mad Lib is, and you find something that you, you're interested in and that you will do consistently, I will end by saying the best tip is, the best kind of exercise is the kind you're willing to do you know, every day, so. Um, you talk a little bit about rehab as well. And, and I often tell people that they need to build a Parkinson's team. We need to be we're sort of not islands under ourselves. We do best when we're surrounded by people that really have our 
quality of life in, in mind. And one of those people that um, is often very beneficial to your team is a physiotherapist, especially when we're talking about exercise. Um, should everyone consult a physiotherapist before starting an exercise program or what role can they play? Uh, this is a great question. Um, so um, we have tremendously underestimated the role of a physiotherapist. So physiotherapy is, is what it's called outside of the United States by, by most locales. And then if you're egotistical like me and you live in the United States, we're not as egotistical as we used to be, but we're, but we're certainly egotistical. We call them physical therapists. But either physical therapy or physiotherapy, um, we have completely underestimated the value of this uh, discipline. And in some cases, it can be more powerful than the drug dealers and giving us giving the drugs. And so where we have fallen down is we have assumed that a referral to any physiotherapist or physical therapist is equal. It's not. Okay. We have assumed that any physical therapy is good and it's not. Some physical therapy for Parkinson patients can make patients fall, for example. And we've assumed that a generalized plan for patients is as good as a specialized plan for an individual patient, and that is false. Okay, so we've, we've made several assumptions now that we're learning are incorrect. And so the role of the physical therapist or physiotherapist in Parkinson disease is to set the plan, okay, for the patients. And in fact, the way that most locales, United States being one, offer therapy is they will give you, you know, like let's say you have a stroke or a neurologic disease and they'll give you six weeks of therapy and then they'll set you out. And we're learning that that is just not adequate for Parkinson disease patients. And in fact, what we need is more interval therapy over time and, and continuously, and that those systems in the brain, we call the basal ganglia, respond to cueing. And so the role of the physiotherapist is to set the plan for the individual patient, which means just like your drug dealer neurologist does an exam, physiotherapy does their exam. And that exam is important to setting what's good for each individual patient in, in the different settings. And they also spend a lot of time with the patients and they can see them going on and off their meds and their dyskinesias and they can actually play an important role in coordinating with the other team members to make sure you're getting the right therapies. And so in the best possible scenario, you go to an experienced physiotherapist first for a full examination and then they give you the plan and you take that plan locally. So let's say you're going to an expert center like Dr. Um, uh, Boss Bloom in the Netherlands, they give you your recommendations and then you go out and you see, you know, in an area, you will see what is the, the, the best possible therapy for you. And then you take that plan back locally and they actually carry that plan out for you. And then the physiotherapist can check back in on you. So the idea of a physiotherapist only staying involved for six or eight weeks and then checking in and out is old school. The new school is let's get a precision therapy, let's check the symptoms, and then even if the physiotherapist gives you the recommendations, maybe they could be done by somebody who's not a physiotherapist. Could it be a physical therapy aide? Could it be a personal trainer? Could it be somebody else? And so we have to think differently about how we're doing things, and we have to think that, that just because the healthcare system is set up in the wrong way for Parkinson patients, that we have to help to teach the, the patients, the families, the persons with Parkinson a better way to navigate. And what benefits um, do ocu does occupational therapy play in terms of so, you know, Occupational therapy is really interesting. Um, when we first started, so Kelly Foote and I started this um, center that became the Fixell Institute back in 2002, we formed interdisciplinary teams and kind of our dream, like the, the dream at that time was could we have a team where the patient's a son and we revolve around the patient. And so we invited in all these therapists, but you know, I, I must say like in reflecting back, I didn't really understand the role of the occupational therapist. And, and I say this with all respect and you know, Lisa Warren, Heather Simpson, um, Bush Gardner Smith, many people I've worked with over the years will hear me say this. And I say this out of complete respect for them because 
it was complete ignorance on my part. And so if I didn't understand it as the doctor, imagine if a family member or a patient doesn't understand the value. And it turns out in the end, and, and Kelly Foote and I say this all the time, and for those of you that don't know, he's our neurosurgeon that we've worked with, pretty well-known famous guy in the field and a really nice guy. We always say, it turns out the occupational therapist, the one we didn't really know what they did, is probably the most important member of the Parkinson's team. Because, you know, whether you're dealing drugs as the doctor, whether you're prescribing physiotherapy, whether you're doing nutrition consults, in the end, the patient or the person with Parkinson has to go back to their home setting and reintegrate back into life. And it is the occupational therapist that assesses your ability to do all these activities of daily living assesses your ability and helps you to develop the strategies so you can go back and be successful in your life, no matter what anybody else is recommending or, or having you do. And there's absolutely nothing more important to the equation, to the healthcare equation that adds value than getting back to your life. So an occupational therapist will do a complete evaluation to see how's your dexterity, is one arm worse or better than the other, you know, what, what sorts of things should you be doing? What's important to you? What do you need to be doing? Where are you at most risk? They're the ones that really reintegrate you back into life. And, and where we fail the most as physicians, we're talking about physician, I'll talk about my failures all hour if you want, but physician failures, where we fail the most is we give out medications, prescribe things, congratulate ourselves, and send the patients and the family members and the persons with Parkinson's home to fail. And the occupational therapist is determined not to let that happen. Right. And are there any resources where patients can find out people that are specialized, allied health professionals that are specialized in Parkinson's, or is it a matter of consulting your own physician for referral? So, um, so it's a little bit of both. Um, unfortunately, we haven't evolved as healthcare systems, um, at least universally on the planet to understand an interdisciplinary approach. We haven't gotten there everywhere. There are certain areas like in the Netherlands that are, are more evolved and in uh, Israel that are more involved. And then you have patchy areas, depending on where you live, say in the United States or in Europe. And so uh, because of that, you know, it's super important as a, 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 you know, a family member or a person with Parkinson super important to be aware and understand what the different team members do. And we sort of talk about this in the Living with Parkinson book, just understanding, you know, and, and this idea that we took too many steps forward without explaining things to patients and why they were important. You know, if you don't understand it, you're obviously not going to be able to integrate into it and you won't be able to appreciate the success and the, and the impact that it can have on your life with impact being the big, the big word. And so depending on the healthcare system or depending on the physician itself to hook you with those resources is sometimes not the best. Parkinson foundations, you know, like the Davis Finney Foundation, who we're on with today, are awesome places to get information because they can immediately identify people in different areas. We have a 1-800 helpline that we've used a number of years at Parkinson's Foundation. And it, but the reality is, is that these, um, these foundation resources are helpful, but the best patients and caregivers are the ones that seek out those opinions and they don't believe one person or one thing and they, they look and sometimes there aren't services available, sometimes there are and sometimes there are clever ways to get services. And we've begun, now we've made more progress in 10 days at the beginning of the Corona COVID epidemic and telemedicine than we did in 10 years. Right. At least in the United States, Canada has been way ahead, the biggest you know, user of telemedicine in the world. So you all are way ahead of us in Canada, so congratulations. But we caught up in 10 days, and we need to keep those services online. And one of the things that we've been focused on is, is pivoting, right? You get a success, you got to pivot on it. We need to keep it, and we need to be doing those services for physical, occupational, speech swallow, and finding other creative ways to reach into people's homes and make sure that they're getting care that actually matters. Right, and, and you mentioned speech language pathology. I think that's something I'd like to talk about as well, but I wanna move on just so we don't lose sight of, of the other excellent information in the book. 
So I just want to move on to nutrition. I mean, Parkinson's disease can kind of affect how we move our food from our mouth and through our digestive system and it results sometimes in difficulty swallowing and indigestion, bloating and constipation. Um, how do we know when we're having trouble with like dysphagia, for instance, swallowing difficulties? What are the signs that someone should look for and how common is it? Yeah, so um, this is a, another highly underappreciated area. You know, so here's another tip. We call them pearls when we're teaching our students and patients. Here's a pearl to take home. One of the most highly underappreciated areas in Parkinson disease is difficulty with uh, swallowing, okay? And so it's not just speech. We often have those two S's together, speech and swallowing. But swallowing, and swallowing problems, people call that dysphagia. It's basically having trouble getting things down your, your throat for a number of different reasons. And if we look at the leading causes of death, not just in Parkinson's disease, but in aging and in other degenerative diseases, it's usually linked to a swallowing problem. And when you have a swallowing problem, a lot of times the food goes down the wrong patch, you know, into the lungs instead of into the stomach. And, and we call that aspiration, okay, when that happens. And in Parkinson's disease, we often have what's called silent aspiration. Okay, so what does that mean? That means you're aspirating and you don't know it. That's a bad thing, you know. And so if you're not getting screened and not getting checked for aspiration regularly with Parkinson, that could be a problem. We totally underappreciate this. We underappreciate the power of people's uh, ability to cough. And so I often, as a clinician, this wasn't something that I learned in day one, but now having taken care of a bunch of Parkinson patients, made a lot of mistakes, had a few successes, you know, I, you, know you, you pick up on a few things and you're, you're a, a, an internist, right? So you, you pick up on things as you take care of patients. It takes a while to, to experience this. We need to pass this knowledge forward having people cough at the bedside and see, <laughs> is, it a, is it a, can they barely cough or can they give you a good cough? If they can't give you a good cough, they're at higher risk. We need to, we need to be aware of that to prevent aspiration. And also we need to um, pay attention to symptoms and tell them, you know, how are they to know if we don't tell them? If you're coughing, you know, or clearing your throat a lot while you're eating, that could be the sign you know, or you could be silently aspirating. So even getting a test every once in a while, every year or two, just to check it out and follow it along. A simple um, swallowing test is what we do, a swallowing study. Super important, can save lives. And then I'll just mention, there is a, a device made by Chris Sapienza, uh, Danny Martin and Paul Davenport that's available called an expiratory muscle strength trainer. Mm -hmm. And they have a level one evidence study published in the journal of Neurology a number of years ago. Um, showing that if you blow into this device a few times a day, it decreases your aspiration risk in Parkinson. And so we have to communicate these things and we have to encourage our next generation researchers to help us to come up with more innovations to address both speech and swallow. But swallowing is one of those pearls that people forget too much about. Absolutely. And where can someone access a device like that that you just described? Oh, I think just like everything, just like our book, Living with Parkinson, I think everything's on Amazon. Um, those researchers, Chris Sapienza is now the dean um, at Jacksonville University. Um, she's, a, she, she's actually just received another um, uh, promotion to provost. She's, she's terrific. And, um, and I often joke that her device, for, it's on Amazon, but for some reason it's not prime, you know, so I don't know why. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so it might take a few days to get there. But, but um but they're, you know, they're relatively cheap, you know, devices, but you do want to do it under um, the care of either a physician or, or a speech language pathologist. All are, are aware of how these devices, because they have to show you how to use them, what the valve. So everything, unless they're done, you know, unless you do something correctly, you could be undoing something. So just making sure that you're doing it right is, uh, is also important. Sure. The one other um, sort of nutritional, um, uh, aspect that you discussed in the book was constipation, treating constipation, because that's, you know, often something that really affects quality of life for patients. Could you just very briefly um, describe some of the things that patients can do to help with that symptom? Yeah, so uh, we have um, over the years developed sort of a constipation formula, you know, so to speak, both our own and talking to other people and 
Uh, one of the people I talked to a number of years ago was actually in Canada, Janice Miyasaki. And, um, and so, you know, a number of us have different combinations and formulas. And so getting, um, getting really family members in tune with getting on a good regimen and staying consistent with that regimen is important because constipation is not only one of the most common symptoms of in Parkinson, it's, it's listed under the non-motor symptoms. Some people might call it a motor symptom, right? Moving through the intestines. But at any rate, it's listed as a non-motor symptom. It is super common. And when we look at web hits, you know, uh, you know, for what people ask about, you know, like number one, number two is always constipation. Constipation, psychosis, some of these things, like, like people are really seeking information. And so it's a problem that's been underappreciated. It may even be the first problem that comes up. And so, so in the book, we have a recipe that we have for, you know, putting, you know, things that you can do in your diet, you know, dietary changes, changes in fiber and things. Uh, exercise helps, okay? A lot of people don't know that. So that's another uh, aspect uh, to this is that exercise can help. And we also um, uh, focus on your water content. So a lot of people are not drinking enough. So drinking can also um, change the, um, the, you know, like how you're going to do with this. And then there are several new drugs that are in trial that we talk about, like ghrelin drugs and other things. But there's also um, safe drugs, like there's a drug called Amitiza. That, um, that you've probably used more in internal medicine than we have in Parkinson, but a great colleague of mine who I chatted with this morning, Teresa Zezowitz, did a, a randomized study of amitiza and Parkinson disease. And, to, and a lot of times you can't give up. You've got to keep talking to your doctor. It's very disabling and you've got to keep trying things. And sometimes it's multiple things. And I have a patient I'm thinking of right now, I've recently been through this with, that, you know, they were having years and years and years of problems. So we just kind of started to, try stuff, you know, in the first couple of times I saw him and, and we didn't like hit a home run, you know, we didn't get the first base and then we got the first base and then we got the second base. And then by the time we got all the way around all the bases, you know, he said, okay, I'm going to stop. All no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. We got to now, is it the, is it this formula? Now we finally figured it out for him or, you know, or is it, was it one component or another? So now we got to work backwards and figure that out. So, so, you know, one of the messages, Sonia, is it takes work to treat constipation and Parkinson and sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's a it's a it's a mixture of things but I mean if you can help somebody with constipation I mean this may sound trite but I think anybody who's here listening today knows this with Parkinson it can rule your life it can be one of the most awful symptoms to have and and, and until you have it you just don't you just can't appreciate that so important pearls um, unfortunately, as we all know, this disease is a progressive one, and inevitably our symptoms tend to get worse, although the rate of that progression may vary, of course, from person to person. But one of the biggest decisions we have as patients um, to make during this desert, our journey is whether to start and when to start medications. So Dr. Oaken, how do we know when it's the right time for us to start medications? And I guess for those of us that are already on them, how do we know when it's time to adjust our current regimens? Yeah, so when is enough enough, I think is the question. You know, when is it time to pull the trigger? You know, for patients struggling with this, I'll, I'll tell you, I even got a message last week, and I not uncommonly get this message from experienced neurologists, okay? Think about that. Let's just pause for a second. So we, we're saying these patients are confused. They don't know when to start medicines. But here we are, and experienced neurologists are asking the same question, right? So, you know, if we just... Have a little bit of perspective. So those of you that are struggling with that question, just keep that in the back of your mind as this is not like a, a simple construct here to decide when to pull the trigger with Parkinson disease. But let me tell you some of the pearls that we talk about in the book and some of the things that Irene and Wissam and I, who are the three authors, some of the ways that we've looked at this that we found to be useful. One, talk to the patient, okay? Talk to the person, okay? I know that sounds easy, but you got to establish, you know, not only what it's like and what symptoms they have, but what do they do? Understand that person. What do they do every day? Not just at work, but at home and other, other you know, areas of their life. What do you do and how is it impacting what you do? And do you realize, some people don't realize it actually is profoundly impacting what they do. You must understand the measure of an impact on somebody's life. Okay, rule two, okay, or B, 
or whatever. You know. So is you have to then once you understand the person, you understand the things that they want to do in their lives. You then have to make a determination of how much disability you think as a treating physician, I'm talking for the physician side, and how much disability they think they have. Because some people actually don't believe that they have disability. So I may look at somebody and say, oh my God, that's terrible. We should do something about that. And they're like, no problem. You know, this is not a big deal. You know, and some, some people are like that with tremor. So I have some people with tremors that are really, you know, like very noticeable. And they're like, doesn't bother me, you know, at all. Doesn't affect me. Doesn't, you know, like, I don't care what my spouse says. Doesn't affect me. You have to take that information into consideration when making decisions. Three or C is you, you then have to um, ask yourself, do, are they in danger? Because sometimes people don't want medicines, but they are in some danger. And one of your primary jobs is to assess the safety uh, of, of somebody. And if you believe that their balance or walking could be off, time out, time to start medicines, okay? Just add it. One of the ways we do that is we sneak up behind people and we give them a tug on their shoulders, okay? And if they can't balance themselves in a step or two, you know, then that's important. And early on in the disease, people often say, well, that's no good because it doesn't respond to dopamine. That's actually not true. We actually realize, particularly early on in the disease, when I see people who are untreated, they can't correct themselves, and then I treat them, and they can correct themselves, and I see the patients back. And so you miss this in articles unless you see hundreds and thousands of patients. And so we tried to communicate some of these things together. Are people still wanting to drive or not? Are they still wanting to work or not? So understanding the, the patients and then making a determination on disability, both in your eyes and in the eyes of the patient, right. and then third, assessing safety. Yeah, the last yeah. thing is, sorry, yeah, just, yeah, just, sorry, a, just one more thing is just, do you believe that in this individual mm -hmm. case that if you don't start medicine, they could get into, into trouble? So this is a discussion, you know, and it's not, mm -hmm. not everybody has to have medicines. But, but a lot of people will read the internet and they'll read um, things. And I've been part of, I won't say a blue ribbon panel, but several panels looking at levodopaphobia and other things. And we shouldn't be fearful of the medicines. Like they're, they're not going to, they're, they're very safe. They're not, you're not going to, we now know from data from Ghana and Italy and other places that if you start medicines a little earlier, it's not going to impact you getting dyskinesia or other things. There are other factors that impact that. And so that shouldn't be driving your decision making in general. We have enough data to know that, but people get can get confused. If expert neurologists can get confused, and I can't answer that question in one sentence, then you can understand why people get confused on that. So we try to cover that in the book. No, I, and I agree. And I think part of the onus is on patients as well. I mean, only we know what our quality of life goals are. Only we know how the disease is impacting the different areas of our life. And it's up to us also to communicate that to you so that you can make informed decisions with us about our, our uh, ongoing care. And I'm glad you mentioned about the um, dopamine phobia or the, the medication, because that's sort of, there were all, there was two schools of thoughts when I was early on in this disease, whether to start or not to start. And I think that it's sort of been proven now that, that we shouldn't be afraid of starting something like Cinemet if it improves our quality of life. Yeah, and there's several studies now, you know, so it's, you know, there were early studies showing if you drop dopamine on a, on a, you know, on cells in a dish, the cells die. That wasn't what exactly happened in the brains of people who were living. And then as the stories evolved, we put that to the test and we actually realized that, you know, it doesn't seem to protect you from losing cells to start dopamine any earlier but it doesn't hurt you either. And so there's been recent studies that have helped us. And so there's really no reason to start if there's not some disability or some impact on quality of, of life or, or some danger. Um, I also think that being ed patients being educated about what their treatment options are is really important. I mean, knowledge is power in, this, in managing this disease as well. Um, can you briefly just talk about the different medications that are available to patients in, in very general terms? Yeah, so, um, so they're, they're in thinking through how to proceed and Melissa Armstrong has a beautiful table um, in this article on JAMA that I think is publicly available uh, for download. 
um, this review article that came out, I think in February of this year. But in thinking through the medicines, it can be very complicated, right? Because, you know, there are dozens of different medicines and lots of different approaches and, and the medicines change over time. It's dynamic and you're, it's not just the color of the medicine or the pill or anything. It's the timing. Okay, so again, we have to talk to people. One of the things we've learned is we got to talk to people. We got to understand when the symptoms are occurring along that cycle. And so there are a whole bunch of medicines that are dopamine replacement therapies. So we talk about Cinemet. Okay, Cin means without, Emet means vomit. So you have to have two parts, carbidopa, levodopa, so you don't vomit, right? But there's also Matapar, which is also a, another formulation in Europe and in other regions of the world. That And those are dopamine formulations, same with Ritari. These are fundamentally dopamine replacements. Then we have um, pills that are called dopamine agonists. They go to dopamine receptors in the brain and they tickle those receptors. So they have different effects, not as robust as just simply replacing the dopamine that's not there, not as robust on some of the benefits like motor, but pretty solid benefits and a different side effect profile. So things like impulse control and dizziness and nausea. Um, maybe um, problems with dizziness when you stand up, some of the other orthostasis. It's so a little different, a little more hallucinations with the dopamine agonists and with dopamine. So it can be confusing. When should you use each one of those two? And then there are drugs that make dopamine a little more available. So those are called monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And dopamine is broken down by an enzyme in the brain called monoamine oxidase and another one called, here's a long one, catechol o methyltransferase, COMT. Okay, so if you if you affect those two enzymes, we have COMT inhibitors like enticapone, which actually doesn't work in the brain, but uh, another one called opicapone. If you, if you actually um, like work and look at, at those specific ones, um, they can make dopamine more available. They have less impact on than the dopamine and dopamine agonists, but they, they can, in some cases, the COMTs can extend the life of dopamine and then the, the MAOBs some people believe, depending on which study you read, there might even be a very tiny, might not be of much, but there might be a tiny protective effect on cells dying with MAOBs like resagiline and selegiline. Um, and, um, and then we know for things like COMT inhibitors, there's specific windows you wanna give them because they can drive more dyskinesia in patients. And then as we cycle through the life, and, and Melissa Armstrong does a wonderful job in her article on this, to cycle through, I mean, think of Parkinson as a lifetime disease. And over the life, you have different symptoms and different windows. And then when you hit a certain window, you know, it might be time to drop a certain medicine like a COMT inhibitor that might cause more dyskinesia. It might be time to think about deep brain stimulation or a duopa pump or an apomorphine pump or something. Or it might be time, you know, where you're getting problems with thinking where you want to drop off some of these medicines like amantadine that's, that's used a lot for uh, dyskinesia, for example, but it might cause hallucinations later on. And so, you, you know, thinking of it in a dynamic terms, timing of pills, lifetime of an individual patient, and that each one of these therapies, either in monotherapy by itself or in cocktail, may have its place at a certain time in a certain patient. But if you ask somebody at a support group meeting or um, pretty, there's so many Parkinson patients there at probably any event that you go to, you're gonna see multiple Parkinson patients, even if it's not a Parkinson event. If you look left or right, everybody's doing something different than they should be. If everybody's doing something exactly the same, then there's a problem. They're probably all seeing the same doctor that's not, that's not you know, the same team that's yeah. not making the change. It should be a very dynamic disease. And, and you have a lot of information in your book. You also have a lot of information about the, some, uh, how to treat some of the non-motor symptoms, which may not respond to dopamine, but covering you know, things like drooling and um, urinary dysfunction and erectile dysfunction, orthostatic hypotension, where your blood pressure drops, fatigue, apathy. I mean, there's a, there's a wealth of information, which I can't believe we're almost at the end of our hour and we won't be able to cover, but it's all there and I encourage people to pick up the book and read. Um, but, I mean, this concept of living well with Parkinson's disease while we continue to search for the cure is, is really a powerful one. Because until there's a cure, it's all about life experience. It's all about our quality of life. It's the way we function day to day. And your book really serves as a resource to help guide patients and their loved ones along this journey with Parkinson's. And I thank you for that. If there is one salient lesson that you would like those that are facing the challenge of Parkinson's to know, what would that be? 
I, you know, um, without a doubt, you know, it, it's that you can live a happy and healthy and good and meaningful life with Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the world, you know, knew that and embraced that and everybody on this planet, you know, believed that and understood that concept, you know, just having been around Parkinson's disease my whole career, I mean, that would make me so happy because, you know, I feel like so many people get it wrong and mm -hmm. they, they lose so much good life because they don't realize you can have a great meaningful life with Parkinson's. And many of my patients have told me their lives are actually better after the diagnosis of their Parkinson than before for various complex reasons, but it does give you that sense of, you know, there, there's, there's, there's every chance for meaning and hope with the diagnosis of Parkinson and, and lots of exciting things going on. So um, I'm not only optimistic, but I'm hopeful because I think there's a difference between optimism and hope. And, um, and I'm very hopeful and that would be the message that I, I would want to send to people. That's great. I mean, knowledge is power and attitude is everything, I think. But Dr. Oaken, thank you so much for your time, insight and expert advice. It was greatly appreciated. I know there are a lot of questions that we weren't able to get to, but um, um, Dr. Arkin has kindly agreed to answer some of those after the webinar um, as well. Um, so I hope you found your time with us helpful and educational. We will be sending out a link for the recording of this webinar in the next few days, which you can share with others. Um, so always remember that you may not have control over your diagnosis, but how you face the challenges that this diagnosis brings is really yours to determine, as Dr. Oaken had mentioned. So focus on optimizing your quality of life, educate yourself, empower yourself, and as Davis Finney says, celebrate your daily victories. And also remember in these turbulent times to stay safe and be smart about things. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Yeah. And remember the Davis Finney Foundation is a great resource and a great foundation. And Davis always says, you know, make every day your best day. And so it's, you know, make sure you're utilizing all the great um, resources that they have. They've helped so many patients and impacted things. And if you get a minute and you like the book or don't like the book, leave us a review on Amazon. We'd love to hear from you. So thank you for having me, Sonia. Thank you so much.